Wendy Spooner understands the pain of defeat and easily gave up when trying something new. She didn't believe in herself or her power to succeed. Can you relate? But as an adult, she learned that failures are part of success, a crucial learning tool on the path to success. You do not want to miss this invigorating interview with Wendy Spooner today. Have you ever felt like giving up, quitting, throwing in the towel? Welcome to Never Ever Give Up Hope featuring Carol Graham. She's an author, health coach, and motivational speaker. Backed into a corner multiple times in her life, Carol shares with you stories on how she overcame some of the toughest obstacles a person can go through in life, but refused to give up hope. Rather than admit defeat, an opportunity was presented, and it involves each and every one of you. Carol will feature spectacular guests who will share their messages of hope, encouragement, and their inspiration to prove why life's adversities only make you stronger. And now, welcoming the host of the show, here's Carol Graham. With me today, I have Wendy Wilson Spooner. She is a professional genetic genealogist by day, a writer by night, and an artist in between. Wherever she finds the time to do all that, I'm not sure. <laughs> so first of all, tell me what a genetic genealogist is. A genetic genealogist uses traditional genealogical records research along with DNA testing to identify living biological family members or those who have gone before um, back to about seven generations. Wow. And most of my clients are adoptees and I assist them in finding their biological families. Isn't, isn't that interesting? My son is an adoptee and uh, this is going mm. to be definitely interesting on a personal level as well. Oh, good. So, Wendy, was there a pivot point that caused you to believe in yourself and your abilities after struggling before? And also, maybe tell us why you were at that place where you did not believe in yourself. When I was growing up, for whatever reason, there was a lot of things going on in my home. There were a lot of really wonderful things about my childhood, and then there were some really, really hard things. But I remember feeling a sense of perfection where if I couldn't do something perfectly, I would quit. I would stop doing it. And um, I had very supportive parents. Uh, there were five kids in my family, and they did everything they could to help each one of us find something we love to succeed at. And um, I just remember feeling very imperfect and that being imperfect meant I wasn't good enough at something and so I shouldn't do it anymore. So I tried all kinds of things when I was growing up and I just never felt good enough at any of them except for art. That was always there. <laughs> But I didn't really do um, a whole lot with that until um, later in my life. Going through some really hard things as a young adult, which was my first marriage, that was rough. And knowing that it's okay to fail and that failing is part of learning to succeed in what you want to do. It was that knowledge and coming to understand that that just gave me wings. It was just something, uh, just a knowing that I've had from that time forward. Consequently, I assume that you put that into your writing. That's that's where your story was. That's where you had your passion. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. My my book characters struggle through a lot, and and the historical chapters of my books, because I write dual timeline. Um, these are based on real people and real lives and very spiritual people um, starving in Ireland and, and, and sending their 
oldest son to cross the Atlantic alone as a teenager to hopefully find a way to save them. And it was their connection to God that got them through everything they went through. Where did your love for history stem from? My love for history stems from probably um, as a child sitting at the feet of my grandparents and listening to the family stories. On my father's side, everyone was Scottish and immigrated from Scotland in the 1800s. This was on my uh, paternal grandfather's side. And I grew up amid the stories and the folklore and the songs of Scotland with my grandfather. And then with my grandmother, same thing. With that was um, mainly immigrants from England, but also deep colonial ancestry in the United States. And I was enthralled by the stories. And I don't know if that is what pricked my love of historical buildings and historical sites, but I had this deepest, deep desire from the time I was a small child driving past an abandoned building or or some kind of historical site, I had to stop and get inside really? of that place to feel what I could feel. It was like I could feel radiating from the floors and the walls the history of those who came before us. And so what di- made you decide to put this into uh, your books? Like how did you transform those thoughts and those experiences into knowing you needed to write about this? When you write a book, it, it's out there. And it could be out there forever. It could have an effect on people for a very, very long time. And putting the history into my writing to young adults really stemmed from Emory University's study on children and youth, teenagers, knowing 20 questions about their family history. And they, they had 20 very specific questions. And they found that The kids who knew these answers to the questions had higher self-esteem. They got higher grades in school. They had a a greater sense of the success of their family unit and several other really positive markers. And, And, you know, this all alludes to the fact that if kids know the answers to these questions... They're having deep conversations with their family members, as I did as a child. And knowing who we come from adds to who we are. And knowing the good and the bad is all great, because those who really struggled and made terrible choices, we don't know why they did that. And it's our job to just honor who they were and what they went through. And then those ancestors that we have that were incredible and made fantastic choices like the one that I wrote about um, in my book series, that particular family. Those we can can learn from as well as being inspired to make better choices ourselves. Which is why you believe it's important to know your personal family history, right? Absolutely, yes. Now what about, like you mentioned earlier, what about adoptees? So adoptees, uh, nurture versus nature my niece and nephew are both adopted and um it's been amazing for me to watch the nurture side of my brother and his wife and the kind of children they erased with um just the nurture side right there's so these two kids are so much like their adopted parents it's it's kind of uncanny sometimes right down to mannerisms and huh. if anybody wants to seek out their biological side, if, if they're feeling compelled to do that, too, it's only going to add to the sense of who you are. And my talking with a lot of adoptees um, as my clients, it's usually women who seek out their biological hmm. family. It's very, very rare that it's men for whatever reason. And, um, but there's always a hole there that they are looking right. to fill. Right. And that hole is filled no matter what they find. If they're completely mm, embraced with the open arms, point. yeah, if they're embraced with the open arms, that that hole is filled. If they are not, that hole is filled because now they have answers that they didn't know. 
I find that absolutely amazing. I never thought of it that way because I think that there, as an adoptive um, parent, I think that there are some children who, or some parents rather, that would be afraid for that reason to possibly expose, you know, the negative things that have happened in their in their uh, baby's life or their child's life. Sure. Is that is that part of the the scenario that that parents struggle with? Wondering oh, absolutely. Whether, yeah. And, but you say, this is, I've never heard this before, that it doesn't really matter. It just, it brings some kind of, I guess you could even say closure, correct? Yes, closure is a really good word. Excellent. Yep. So, yep. oh, that, that, that's inspiring. I appreciate you sharing that. Now, yeah. where do you get your ideas to do your research? Like, what, what are your triggers or do you have any that you look for? So, often in my own family, um, any, anybody who's interested in family history is going to attest to the fact that once you find an ancestor that piques your interest and you start finding out details of their lives, it becomes a rabbit hole that you go down until you have turned over every yeah. single rock and found every detail about this ancestor's life. And um, it can become addicting. It's the grandest adventure I've ever been on. And I have traveled the world and done a lot of things on my life. And researching um, my family tree and other people's family trees <laughs> is truly the greatest adventure I've ever been on. Have you or anyone you did research for ever get a real shocking surprise when they did that? Yes. I, I, yes. I will share this one quick story. Uh, with a a client I had who was trying to find her biological father. And she had many people that we had identified in her family tree that we were testing, and this was quite a few years ago, to see if we could get closer to the correct line mm. of who her, her biological family was because it was a huge family tree. It was It was probably the largest one to date that I had built. And but there were lots of divorces and remarriages and just a lot going on in this family tree. And she found a, I believe it was an uncle that um, agreed to test to see if, if this line was going to show a closer link to her biological father. And the DNA test came back and he was 100% not biologically related to his family. And he didn't know Oh my and word. he was also he was also blind and old. This was an elderly person, and we chose not to tell him that we had this information. Uh, and that's that's yeah, that's something that you come across from time to time, and that's just and really, of course, I left that up to my client. Do you want to tell him or not? You know, she's. I just think it's the best not to tell him. Uh-huh. And the reason this man was blind was because he had attempted suicide at one point that left him blind. So not tampering with somebody who had um, dealt with mental illness would be, you know, you just have to make those right, of course. sound ethical decisions. And some, and I believe that the truth will set you free, but sometimes it's not your place to tell someone the truth. And that's a hard decision sometimes. Of course. Absolutely. I, I get that. If someone listening would like to become a client of yours, could you tell us the the process and what type of people you may be looking for? I am looking for anybody who feels ready for the emotional roller coaster that you would literally be stepping onto on the journey of finding your biological family. So the average age of my clients is somewhere between 40 and 60. Interesting. Yeah. So it's, it's a time in life when people start thinking, you know, if I don't start looking for my family, they may be gone. They may have passed away by the time I find them. So I, that's that, why that age group is kind of pivotal when people really feel that push. And, um, the process will be, gathering as much information as I can from the client as to what they do know about their case. And then I take it from there and work closely with the client um, in, in the entire journey. 
filling them in every step of the way so that they can feel part of that journey. Mm -hmm. And I've had a couple clients who just got really scared during the process because they realized they weren't ready to know. And so they stopped the process. And I think that's a wise decision. Yeah, sometimes uh, ignorance is bliss, right? Right. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we're going to take a very quick 30-second break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about your novel. And you are going to have a gift that you are offering those who have listened to this podcast today. That is an incredible gift. So you do not want to miss the second part of the interview with Wendy Spooner. And we'll be right back. Carol Graham would like to show you the path from misery to miraculous triumph in her fast-paced memoir, Battered Hope. She relates her determination to succeed as someone who experienced one horrendous nightmare after another. Gang raped and left for dead, loss of a child, husband falsely imprisoned, and cancer. Nothing could break her tenacity or faith. No matter what you face, heartache, loss, suffering or injustice, Carol will illustrate how she became a victor the same way you can. The secret is to never, ever give up hope. Order your copy at Amazon or batteredhope.blogspot.com. We are continuing our interview today with Wendy Spooner, who has been sharing a lot of things that are interesting to not only me, but I know many members of our audience. And as I promised, Wendy has a special gift for you, for those who listen to this entire podcast. And it's a phenomenal gift, believe me. So before we get into that, please tell us about your art, because you are not just an author, you are also an artist. Yes, I am. And if there was one thing I was born with, I would say it was it's the ability to create art. And I'm a painter. And I paint in the mediums of oil and acrylic and watercolor. And I also love pastels. I can't really describe what art has done for me in my life. But yeah. I am a an award-winning artist on the national level in the medium of acrylic. And I won first place in what's called the American Heritage Contest. Yeah. And I love to put ancestry into my art pieces and this particular piece that won I staged um, my father-in-law's memorial flag he's a veteran from the Korean War with my hands wearing one vintage glove from the 1940s and my other hand did not have a glove on it so it was showing my wedding ring and my hands were lying on the memorial flag and the flag was lying on a white cloth, like it was on the top oh, of a casket. Wow. And then behind that, I um, wrote a short essay, which is required to enter this contest so that the judges know right. what's behind the painting. So I talked about my father-in-law, who was not only a veteran, but he was a forester and a farmer and one of the best examples of a um, patriotic family man in America that I've ever known. And then I talked about my grandmother, who during the Great Depression, she taught piano lessons to all the kids in her neighborhood to put food on the table while my grandfather had to go work in another state. And she had two little boys that she raised by herself for that two-year period. And um, there are different wars that we fight in Mm. this country. Uh And when, when our men go off to war, the women and children that are left behind fight a different kind of war. And that is what went into that art piece, that one first place. And Ancestry and the Arts is a lecture that I give, and I speak on that topic a lot. And I put that into my present-day teenage struggling character in the book series. At what point did you switch to writing novels? So I was an award-winning poet and family history writer uh, when I decided to write novels because... I went to Ireland in 2012 with my parents and my husband, and we were there for a very specific reason in Northern Ireland. We were trying to find additional family members in a line that we had been working on. And 
what we found was way more than we bargained for, which included <laughs> the family estate from the late 1700s on the west coast of Ireland in County Donegal. The town is called Mount Charles. It was intact and original and vacant. Oh, and my goodness. We, we were with a, a distant cousin who we had connected with in Ireland who was taking us to all the family graves. And she drove by the gates of that estate and she said, if you were to climb the wall and explore, I'm sure no one would bother you. <laughs> and we couldn't get out of the car fast enough or over that wall fast enough. And what we found was acres and acres of coastal forest mm. and the original gardens, manor house, carriage house, the stables and the dowager house. It was all intact and original. And um, that was when I thought, oh, my gosh, there is so much to this family story that I, I've got to write this. And I didn't tell anybody because I didn't know how I was going to find the time to do it. Mm -hmm. And I just started working, slowly working on it. And I had six chapters written, the first six chapters. And my laptop that I was taking on every um, road trip, long or short, so I could write while my husband was driving, it fell out of my car. Oh. And that laptop was destroyed. And I lost those first six chapters. And that's when I had to step back and say, okay, how committed am I to doing this? <laughs> and something in me said, you have to do this. And I got a new laptop, started over, and of course had a, a good backup system after that. <laughs> and I just went from there. But the first book took me three years to write because there was so much research involved. So after I went to Ireland, I researched in the United States where this kid went when he immigrated from Ireland and who he became in the United States, which was astounding. So there was just a lot of research and a lot of travel involved. And then there was so much information I found on this young man, including a 400 page master's thesis that was written by a student at Ball University oh. on him huh. because he became such a frontier capitalist and that is why this student wrote about him. So I had this wealth of information and books and books and books because of who he became. And I wanted to stay very true to the history. That was the number one most important thing to me. But also build out the story so that it would suck people in and spark in them their, an interest in their own family trees. And the messages I get from readers time and time again is that is exactly what the book series does for them. Interesting. Now, this was your debut mo uh, novel, right? Yes. And it became a bestseller in several different categories, several different genres. Could you tell yes. us what those might be? Yes. So the genres were young adult, civil war, historical fiction, young adult, Christian relationship fiction, young adult historical fiction and the fourth one <laughs> my word, and I can't pull lot. it out of my memory <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing so now how many books in this series so far so there are two books in this series there could be a third one right now I'm not compelled to write it although my readers are asking all the time if I'm writing it but um, it's possible that the third book will take place in India because in this family line, the, um, the paternal, the, the paternal, yes, yeah, the father of the matriarch of this family in this book in Ireland, he was a colonel in the British army and he lived in Calcutta, India for most of his life. And he died and was buried there, but he sent his daughter who is actually my third great grandmother back to Ireland to the estate that we explored to be raised there instead of India, just like the story of the secret garden. Really? Oh yes, my so, goodness. That is so interesting. Wow. So that's a really tempting third book for me to write. Now you, as I said earlier, a couple of times, you do have a gift for our audience today. And what yes. is that? So the gift is my two book 
series. I would absolutely love to give that away to one of your listeners. Now, is there anything you would like to say in conclusion just about your life or as a word of encouragement for people or anything that you would just want to be sure and get into this interview? Um, There are two things. So if you don't believe in yourself and you're compelled to do something, first of all, listen to that voice that is compelling you to do something because it's going to be important in your life and for other people if you do it. And don't be afraid of all the failures along the way. And secondly, if you haven't already started exploring your family tree, look to those who came before you because they're only going to add to your confidence to help you do that thing that you're compelled to do. Two very different statements and two very important statements. I thank you for sharing both of those. Is it okay if I share one more thing? Absolutely, whatever you would like. So Stephen R. Covey is an author that that all of us love because he's so inspiring, so compelling. And the very last book that he wrote in his life that his daughter actually published after he passed away is called Live Your Life in Crescendo. And that book is Hmm. all about the greatest thing that you will ever do is still ahead of you, no matter how old you are. Well, the greatest thing you will ever do is still ahead of you no matter how old you are. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you so much, Wendy, for being on Never Ever Give Up Hope. Thank you for listening to Never Ever Give Up Hope featuring Carol Graham. Did you know that most people succeed because they are determined to? Quitting was never an option. Carol loves your comments and will respond to each one. So please subscribe and review this podcast. A rating of five stars would be outstanding and appreciated. Remember, if you are still here, there is always hope.